I, I know that this class on Shemitah comes at the end of a day of classes on Shemitah, if you've been following that track. And I come with humility, not knowing what has been said before me. And I, I really encourage you at the end of the, of the class when there's time for conversation, if there's something that you would like to share that you learned earlier today that would open up the conversation even further, please do so. And I'm excited to learn from you uh, what you've learned today about Shemitah. I come with, with the, um, the recognition as well that when I began to prepare for this year, I was actually preparing for teaching at Camp Stone this summer. And I wanted to find a way to think about Shemitah in light of the fact that so many of us, assuming most people on the call at 8, 12 at night, live in America and would not have the opportunity to perform the mitzvah of Shemitah in Eretz Yisrael this year. And I, I bore that in mind when I was thinking about, you know, what is it in Shemitah? What is it in the ideas and the conceptual frame of Shemitah that is useful and that we could learn from today living in the diaspora? So that was really my goal when I came into this year. Um, and the second, if you've studied with me before, you know that I, I, I teach Breshit um, at SAR High School. And, and Breshit is kind of my, my frame for thinking about many things. So it was not a coincidence, I think, when I, when I came to the thesis that I'll share with you in a moment that connected Breshit to Shemitah in order to find this conceptual frame that would be useful to us living again without access to keeping the mitzvot of Shemitah. So here's the thesis. And then I wanna spend the next half an hour or so showing you a little bit about how I think this plays out. So the argument is that I think according to Breshit, and as you read moving past Breshit Shemot further into the Humash, that Shemitah acts as a kind of safeguard a way to keep us true to our potential as human beings. Living as a nation in our land against the inevitable and natural blind spots of human nature. Okay, that's the big idea. Shemitah is like a stopgap. Shemitah comes kind of far along in the journey of the Jewish people in response to so many of the natural, as I say, blind spots that are built into us that we see unfolding over the course of Reshit, when it's not yet the story in the initial chapters of the Jews, but it is the universal story, we find Shemitah as a way to kind of respond and make sure that we don't fall back into the place where we began. Now, what do I mean by that? If you remember, and we'll see again in a moment when we look at the Psukim, Reshit teaches us who we are in our essence. Reshit also teaches us who we ought to be lays out our potential, teaches us about the fundamental relationships that we need to honor. We're gonna call those axes. And as you move past the opening chapters, we see all the ways in which we fail, right? We test out some of those relationships, we test out some of the potential, and we keep bumping up against fundamental obstacles. This is like a sweeping overview of what we already know. Rachel Yudbet, Avraham, is one response, is the first response, is Hashem saying, okay, new plan here, new way of accessing human potential, covenant. Family, special relationship, one individual turning into a family, beginning of direct instruction, leading us away from our worst selves or our worst shortcomings. And the story continues, of course, moving us into Matan Torah, which is another shlav, another stage, in the plan to help us with direct instruction, to give us many more ways and tools and sets of, of rules that teach us how to honor again those fundamental relationships. We can borrow from the Rambam and the Morin Avufim when he talks about the purpose of the mitzvot, right? Every single mitzvah is there according to the Rambam to benefit us in one of three ways, to teach us how to develop our, our moral qualities, our moral character, to teach us how to build a civil society and how to develop the most appropriate and correct opinions, which of course means philosophy. So the Torah is stage two, again, in, the, in, in God's plan for teaching us how to self-correct and move on the path which is going to lead us to our greatest potential. And finally, coming into Eretz Yisrael, 
as the narrative continues, when we have the opportunity in Jewish history to live out our lives as a, as a free and independent society and nation, expanding beyond the contours of where we started as an individual, a family, a nation, but a nation now with sovereignty and the ability to have influence in the surrounding culture. And you would think with all that in place, we would be geared to go, we would be set up again, against those blind spots. And I wanna argue finally that Shemitah comes in to kind of mop up whatever's left, whatever the whatever revelation and covenant doesn't already take care of, Shemitah is the safety net and brings us back to our best selves. That's the thesis. Now, what am I talking about? First, we gotta go back to Brayshit and I wanna show you what I mean by those relationships that are set up, by that potential which we're exposed to and by those blind spots or those shortcomings which are built into the fabric of being a human being. I am going to share my source sheet, which you have access to. Um, hopefully this will work. Oh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing, Shabi. Do you mind making, okay, there we go. Yeah, you should be able to do it now. Okay. Mm. No, it's not working. So, so I, well, I could share screen. One second. All right. Um, okay. I wanted to share my screen because it has the English and Hebrew side by side, but everybody, you know, when you're, when you're in Safari, if you want, you can enable the English on top right there by clicking the, um, go over to the left. Okay, there we go. So now we have the English and the Hebrew side by side. Is there any way to make that bigger? Yeah. Okay. So Shabi, you will see, I'm gonna need you to kind of scroll, scroll with me. Yeah, right? you got it. Okay, so Rishi Paragala is so familiar, but it's the place we always come back to. It's where, again, we continue to find the nuggets that nourish us and challenge us. And true story, I mentioned in the beginning that I taught this at Camp Stone this summer. I had a packet that was about as long, if not longer, as the one that you have in the Safari source sheet. And in 10 Shirim, we never got past the Psukim and Rishi Paragala. So hopefully we, we, we will do so tonight. Rishi Paragalif, again, teaches us who we are, who we ought to be, and we find out so much about ourselves, not just through the words, but through the style of Paragalif. You only have on your sheet day six, but you know from memory, day six comes after days one, two, three, four, five, a highly stylized, regularized Perak, so unusual, repeating words, repeating verbs, right? All of the creation is described as creation through speech, and we see in the beginning of every day, the word Vayomer, Vayomer Elohim. God is always referred to as Elohim in Parak Aleph. And God says, right, the, 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 the command for the thing to be created. And then of course it's reported that it was created. The effortless kind of creation, which we are not capable of. Although we of course create and destroy worlds with words as well, emotional and social worlds. So we have here in the beginning of day six, the start of our story, even before human beings enter the scene, because part of our day is shared with animals. So if you look at Psukim Chavdalen and Chavhei, the first part of day six is the creation of the animals. And there's so much in common, not just sharing of the day, but there's so much in common between ourselves and the animals, also referred to right, Nefesh Chaya, um, and, and Hashem creates the animals there. And at the end of Pasuch Hapei, Vayar Elohim Kito. If you scroll down a little bit, here are the Psukim, of course, about the creation of human beings. We all know them, but I just want to make reference to, to a few aspects. Pasuch Hapei begins famously, Vayomer Elohim Na'ase Adam. If you've been following the, the patterns throughout Perak Aleph, this is a kind of wake up call, what's going on, Na'ase. It's a different verb, right? It's the plural, who is a God talking to, various possibilities, but however you understand it, it is honing you in and saying something different is going on here. This is not like the other creations. The, despite the fact that it follows in pattern, here something is new. 
right after Nasa Adam, again, something new, Bitsalmenu Kidmutenu, nothing else in the entire story of the creation is described as bearing God's likeness or image. Again, what, what, what does that mean, right? Famous question, we'll come back to it in a minute. God says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. The year do be gatayam uva of hashamayim uba behema uva chol haaretz uva chol haremes haromes al haaretz. In this pasuk, we find out about two fundamental relationships that bear our character, that bear on our character. Number one, our relationship with God. It's right there, described bitzal menu kidmutenu. Right. So, what does that mean? Putting aside for a moment, it certainly means that we have automatically an, an inborn relationship with God that's far different than any, any other creature. And there's something about us that reflects, represents, mirrors God's essence on this world. That's relationship number one. And I'm going to call that, you know, the vertical relationship or the vertical axis. Relationship number two is our relationship to the natural world. There's that verb, they year do. They shall rule over in this translation. All of the animals that were just described in days five and the beginning of day six. If you only look at that word, it looks like our relationship is a relationship of, of hierarchy, right? And our job in some sense or our character in some sense is informed by our job to rule over to dominate, to have some kind of sovereignty over the animals. This past year when I was teaching in Chovave, one of my students was very focused on this word do, and he brought it up, rightfully so, in an environmental con uh, environmentally conscious way and said, this word might be responsible for so many of our errors. I was astounded at first because I'd never quite read it that strongly. But remember that we're coming back to it. They year do. Now, the problem with they year do and looking at it as domination and ruling is that if we were in a classroom and you would respond and I'd say, what does that mean? In what sense are we ruling over animals? The first thing that pops into, into our head is eating animals. But of course, we know in Breshi Paragalif that we do not eat animals at the beginning. The, the permissibility to eat animals comes only after the flood. So that kind of domination or hierarchy, if that is the correct way of understanding the year do, is not fulfilled by eating. And then you have to ask yourself, well, what does that mean? In what way is that fulfilled? We rule over animals, really? We have some kind of, right, put, put yourself in, in, in whatever wild context you have, been, you have been in in your life. In what sense did you feel like the ruler? Right? There's a lot of fear that we actually have when we are inside the animal kingdom. So what does vigor do mean? Some possibilities that I've heard has, have meant not that you actually rule over, but you should know that you are on, on a higher level. You should have that awareness, right? You should comport yourself as not a part of the animal kingdom, which of course we are. And as day six makes clear, we are, we share the day. But vigor do is giving you a, a kind of mission, a headset, that you have to, you should, you ought to see yourselves as human beings as not a part of the human king, the, the, the animal kingdom. But that we're gonna call the kind of, you know, um, axis, the, the relationship with the natural world. We have the vertical with God, and now we have the second one with the natural world, which we're again leaving somewhat ambiguous. Finally, we have the third fundamental relationship which shows up in Pasuk Chavzayin and Chavchet. Vayivra Elohim et ha'adam b'tzalmo, b'tzalem Elohim bara oto, zacharu nekeva bara otam. Reading one more Pasuk. Vayivarech otam Elohim, vayomer lahem Elohim, pru urvu umilu et ha'aretz v'chivshuha. Uridu, there's that word again. Bidgat hayam uva'ov hashamayim, uva'chol chaya haromeset al ha'aretz. So when the act of creation happens, number one on the top of Chavzayin, vayivra, a special verb. Again, does not surprise us, kind of a partner to na'aseh, right? In its strangeness in the flow of text in Parakalif, again, signaling our uniqueness. There's Selim Elohim again, several times in the Pasuk. 
But at the end, we find out, Zacharu nekeva bara otam. Again, we're very familiar with this phrase. We've talked about it, thought about it a lot. Tonight, I want us just to look at it as the pasuk which introduces us to our third relationship, which is the ethical. The third thing we find out about ourselves at the very beginning is that we are created fundamentally in relationship with the other. Zachar unekeva bara otam. As soon as there is an oto, there is an otam. And when God blesses us and gives us our mission in, in verse 28 and Pasuk Chavchet, he is talking to both at once. There is no differentiation between Zachar unekeva. There is no really otam that is separate. It is one unit and they receive those instructions together. And those instructions, of course, especially if you focus on pru or vu, are instructions that can only be accomplished in union, can only be accomplished in community. And I'm, I'm quoting here, I'm referring to Rav Salavejic and the Lonely Man of Faith when he looks at chapter one and says, when human beings are created in chapter one, he famously calls us Adam one, we are part of a natural community. It's the most obvious thing in the world. Of course, we live in community. Of course, we need each other. Of course, to be a human being and to fulfill ourselves means that we have to live together with the other. But here's a question, right? If we pull back for a moment and look at the vertical, the horizontal, and I'm not really sure what to call the environmental, right? X, X Y, and Z axis, those three relationships that are part and parcel of who we are, they're so essential and they all seem to be perhaps wrapped up in Selim Elohim in order to live the Selim Elohim, right? Again, in the vertical, so to speak, you do that by living together with other people in an ethical relationship where you see the other as fundamentally equal to yourself. And you live that in a way where you learn how to honor the environment in which you are presented, in which you actually are placed, such that you know who you are, you know your quote unquote domination without resorting to eating or violence. But all of those fundamental, fundamental relationships are left with very little detail about how to put those into place, right? The one that's easiest for us to, to, to fall back on, I would say, is Zacharu Nekeva Bara Otam. We're still trying to figure that out. What does it mean to live in a world? It seems so simple and it's so hard to play itself out. What does it mean to live in a world where we recognize the other as part and parcel of who we are? The Oto, that's an Otam, and understand that the people around us and the people beside us and the people who we, with whom we live are fundamental partners in helping each of us live out our Tzalem Elohim. We're still working that out. So Breshi Perak Aleph, and I'm gonna pause here for a moment just for some questions or comments if you have any. Breshi Perak Aleph sets up the paradigm where to be a human being is to live in alignment with three relationships that truth be told are not quite separate. They can't be lived and honored without respect to the other. To repeat the three, the vertical, our relationship with God, which is left very ambiguous, but somehow it's through emulation and activity, right? By living the Tzalem Elohim, by living that out, you are honoring your relationship with God, the horizontal, which is the ethical relationship with the others in our lives. And finally, the relationship with the environment here presented in terms of the animals, but expanded later in Breshi to accommodate, of course, and earlier in Paragalif, the trees and the plants and everything that we are placed into, that is our environment, those three relationships. Okay, just wanna pause there for a moment, Shabi, if that's all right. If anybody has any comments or questions, put them in the chat or unmute yourselves before we move on. There's also a way if you prefer to virtually raise your hand, if you click reactions on the bottom of your screen and then I'll be able to unmute you, that's easier. All right. If something pops up later, you'll have time again. All right, that's Breshi Parakala. Let's move on 
Shabby, if you don't mind screen sharing again, to Rashid Perak Bet. And Rashi Perak Bet, we're only looking at the first three psukim, which of course are part of Rashi Perak Aleph. It's a quote unquote story of Shabbat. When you're, when you're reading or rereading Rashi this coming year, and you come to Rashi Perak Bet and you see, wait, what are those psukim doing there? Right? You know that, of course, the Christians made the, the chapters, but in the Aliyah, it concludes with these psukim. And there are so many. Um, there, there are so many. I just lost my, you told me the chat is distracting for people. That's just distracted me. Greg, one minute. Um, the, the, these psukim, there's so many literary clues that teach us that these psukim, of course, are the summation and are part of the first account, which is in Breshi Parakala. Um, Greg, how would I translate it? It's a really good question. I guess I would say, I guess what I was trying to say was um, Urudu means to be responsible for, right? It's not an exact translation. Um, Reish Dalid Hey, by the way, is the Shoresh, not Yud Reish Dalid, which we think it looks like. It doesn't mean descend. Um, Reish Dalid Hey really does mean to rule over, but it, it, it doesn't seem to be logical to translate that or to take that translation in, in the way that we normally understand it. Um, Shabby, I think Yael had her hand up too. Sure, Yael, you should be able to unmute now. Okay, good. Um, so I had a question then. So if we have like all these relationships, these three relationships, then there are going to be down the road meets vote, right? That help enforce those relationships perhaps. And then some of those meets vote overlap, correct? Like take cash route for example. So is that like an example of like Vayardu? and knowing that you're different than the animal kingdom, or is that ethical and building community? I love that question, and I'm not gonna answer it um, because A, I need to think about it, and B, that's precisely the point, y'all. That's actually what I think Rashid is teaching us is that the categories that we normally operate in are false categories, right? And, and I think, right. and, and thank you, thank you for, for making it clear. I think what I was trying to say and what Shemitah, if we get there, is really going to help us see is that these three relationships can't be entertained or explored or honored on their own to the exclusion of the others. That's a distortion, right? And so the three are totally or ought to be totally intertwined. It's actually really hard to do that. It's really hard to deepen all three at once. And maybe it doesn't mean all at once, but it certainly means over the course of your life as an observant. Of your life. Yeah, wow. beautiful, beautiful. Okay, let's go back to Chi Perak Bet quickly. Making you work, Shabby, apologize. Okay, so um, just two points that I wanted that I wanna make here on these psukim. Um, of course, we see in the beginning of these psukim, the idea the, fir the, the first time we see that God introduces the notion of, of rest and the kind of the notion of, of pulling back, which of course we can anticipate as Shemitah, right? Which is going to be uh, much more fully developed. There's nothing here in Breshit Perak Bet which describes our observance of Shabbat, but the, the but Chazal see already clues and hints, right? Take a look at Rashi later, right? That there is already, what does that even mean? That this day was made sanctified. The notion of holiness, Chazal, already connect to our observance of Shabbat. And of course, later, when you look at um, Shabbat, when it comes to Nasser Hadibrot, it's referencing these psukim. And so we see here already the idea of perhaps part of what it means to live B'Tselem Elohim, part of what it means to follow God's pattern is to live with a balance of this sort between productivity and with pulling back, right? And recognizing that part of growing, acting and negotiating with the world demands periods of withdrawal, right? Or functioning in the world with the different relationship to things. That's what we experience each week on Shabbat. That's what it is. We don't leave the world, we're in the world, but we reorient ourselves and we, understand differently how we function in relationship, hopefully 
by the way, with all three relationships, right? With, with the ethical, with the environmental and with God, we mostly talk about Shabbat Lashem or, 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 or for yourself, but it could also be a time where you understand differently your relationship to the environment and that only comes through withdrawal. So this is where God does what this, this kind of balancing act and it's already anticipating our weekly balancing act and eventually Shemitah. Okay, um, mo moving on. I'm not gonna get to everything, but, but I wanna just, I wanna show you one piece from this Mishnah and then we'll actually get to Shemitah. So this is again, a very famous Mishnah from, from Sanhedrin. Um, the, the context, is the speech that would be given to the Adim when they were coming to testify, God forbid, if they, they witnessed or they thought they witnessed um, a murder. And, and the mission is describing here the kind of, you know, how would you freak them out so that they would understand that what they're about to do has very significant ramifications. Um, scroll down a little bit, keep going. Um, keep going, um, okay. Perfect. Um, um, actually, go up a teeny. Sorry, a little bit. Okay. Um, okay. So they're telling right. You would tell the witnesses. I'm looking here in the Hebrew, right? That shaloki dine mamono dine nefashot. That that this is not the same thing. To come and be a witness for a deep, for a capital is not the same thing if you're dealing with money, right? Because the person's life is in the balance. Okay, keep going. All right. Lefichach nivra adam yichidi. Lelamedcha shekol ha meabed nefesh achat mi Israel. Maale alav hakatu kiilu ibed olam male. The hol ha mekayem nefesh achat mi Israel. Maale alav hakatu kiilu kiyem olam male. I love that actually. I love how the Mishnah shows us both sides of it that we could have probably deduced on our own, but gives them an opportunity to, to flesh out this concept, right? That a per everybody, we, we, we started out in this world as one, right? It did not, the story was not told or it, or it wasn't formed. It didn't come this way as a, as a family, but we started as one, one that's two, as we said, to teach us that anybody who God forbid destroys a nefesh it's as if they have destroyed an entire world. Anybody who saves an Efesh, it's as if they have saved an entire world. Yes, that's true. Another gear so omits Yisrael, right? And that would be more in line with what we're saying here with gray sheets. We could understand why you would be put in here because the context is, right, a, a baiting for Jews. And we also understand how, according to gray sheet, it doesn't belong there. Okay. Continuing in the Mishnah for a moment. Okay. Apologize. Lefichach kol achad the achad chayav lomar bishvili nivra haolam. Okay, this Mishnah is stacked. There's so much to talk about. I want to pull out just a few things that that help us cultivate this idea of where we started and where we're heading with Shmita. So first of all, the Mishnah establishes this idea of a person as a whole world. Right, every person is a whole world makes demands on our ethical behavior, right? Quite, quite directly in this context, how we act as potential witnesses, recognizing our responsibility towards each other. If I look at each of you on the screen and I truly understand that you are a whole world, what does that do to me? What does that do to my responsibility to, to respond to you and, 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 and to respect you, right? Not just God forbid in a case like the Mishnah, but in everyday dealings. The idea that every person is a whole world and some of the other lines I don't have now in front of me from the Mishnah, it's okay, Shabi, right? Also hone in on this idea of our radical equality because each of us is that whole world and each of us came from Adam Yechidi and each of us is that Matbeah, 
that coin, right, that the Mishnah talked about so beautifully, that comes out looking differently. As Rav Greenberg said, each of us is infinitely unique. Each of us is infinitely valuable, right? And what is the third? And each, each of us is infinitely equal. So what the Mishnah is suggesting uh, that comes from Breshit, right? If each of us is this whole world, if each of us has to look at ourselves, bishvilini, ra olam, right? That is usually, I would say, back to the blind spots for a moment, which, which I haven't really developed. Here's blind spot number one, right? Bishvilini Raha Olam. Okay, so I have to take myself seriously and I have to and I have to really, you know, honor myself. But the blind spot is that lead that could, God forbid, lead to human arrogance. Right? If I really take that seriously, it's all here for me, right? And I, I am the whole world that could very easily tilt its way into terrible kinds of behavior and attitudes, right? Um, especially if I stop there, bishvilini raha olam, and I don't recognize that gam bishvilech, right? For gam bishvilcha. So each of us, right, that's the challenge. First to honor yourself, then not to honor yourself too much, then to recognize that each person also has that same relationship with the world. Second thing that I want to tease out from this, and this is maybe a little bit of a, I don't know what, okay, call it what you want. It's like taking, taking us a little further maybe from the Pshat of the Mishnah, but in an environmental sense, right, and go back to Breshin and go forward to Shemitah, if each of us could say bishvilini ra olam, then that actually means that each of us stands in relationship with the natural world with full on responsibility. Because it's really mine, the whole world is mine. The whole world is my responsibility. Now talk about climate anxiety, that is like the worst thing to say to anybody under the age of 20, right? They already feel it, they already recognize it. So that doesn't mean that's not meant to be taken literally. And my and my campers, you know, my my students at Camp Stone, that was it freaked you out. But there's some truth to it, right? There's some truth. There's some truth to that understanding that fundamentally the responsibility of the world. It, who, who, who does it reside on? Right? The other person. It resides on each of us. So bishvilini raha olam is a kind of totalizing picture. Not just go back to the axes, right? Not just about our relationship with the other but also about our relationship with the environment. And of course, of course, of course, our relationship with God, because that's where this comes from. Okay, um, we have 16 minutes left and I'm going to do a very quick recap of the end of Rashid and take us to Shemitah. And I wanna leave time for questions. So Rev Cook probably will have to wait for Shabbos it's at the end of your sheet, but you'll do that, you'll do that on your own. Okay, so the quick recap is, of course, after Breshi Paragalif and after Breshi Paragbet, if we keep in mind this idea of the three axes that we are asked to honor and really given very little detail about how to do that, if you look at the great failures of the rest of the first half of Breshi, right, leading us to Migdal Bavel, they are all stories where we see failures of one axis over the other. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Let's just choose two. Kain and Hevel. Kain and Hevel, right? If you were speaking, you would all say, oh, Kain and Hevel, that's a story of the failure of the horizontal axis, right? It's like, what, what, could be a, what could be a more extreme example of that, right? The failure of the ethical leading to murder. But actually, if you look at it more closely, you see that it's a story where, you know, Kain was presumably trying to get close to God. Right, and he was he was offering a korban. We don't really know why. It doesn't tell us, but that was that's a vertical, that's a vertical axis thing. The relationship with the brother kind of you know got in the way, and he acted out his frustration vis-a-vis -vis the vertical on the horizontal. Right, so that's a breakdown of the alignment. That's a breakdown of realizing that those two things you can't do one without the other. You can't just like right work on this. You're only this only makes sense if you're looking on the screen because I'm using my hands. Right, work on the vertical and ignore the horizontal. And very quickly, if we think of just skip to the ends, but now that you're thinking about it, you, you, you get what I'm saying and you can plug in any of these stories that you know. But if you get to Migdal Bavel, Migdal Bavel seems like the opposite, right? That seems like, well, it depends if you're thinking through Rashi or not, but is that a story of the failure of the vertical? Certainly like visually, that's, the, that's what the story seems to be, right? People trying to reach up, 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 up. Um, and, and, and overtaking according to Rashi, right? And trying to really take what's not theirs and say to God, get out of there, this is right. But, but really what the story on some level is also about is people who were ignoring 
those who are right in front of them, ignoring their independence of spirit and thought and creating a kind of, you know, group think. And this was something, again, my, my um, students at camp really related to, right? Ha, ha, you get five people in a room, you can't agree on, on what activity to do. Imagine a whole society, right? Let's work together. Sure, pass me a brick, right? Everybody having the same idea, that's not a thing. That is only possible if there's a dictator. And of course, that's how Chazal read it. There is an invisible dictator in the form of Nimrod. But even if you don't go there, you see there that this is a society which is going to collapse because they do not honor the other. There is no horizontal relationship. It's all in favor of the vertical. You see what I'm saying? So that's the first half of Breshit. We see people really trying to activate one or the other, but failing because they're ignoring another axis at the same time. Then comes Breshi Parikibet, and that's where we see the beginnings of, of the second tact, as we said, where the covenant enters the story. Um, the last thing I will just say about that first early recap cap is that many of the stories, if you think about it also, are acted out on the environment, right? Go back and look and see how prominent Eretz is, right? All through these stories. And of course, the Mabul is the place to go to see that most dramatically. But all throughout the stories, there is a kind of failure, a lack of understanding of how human actions affect the natural world, right? Think of Kayan and Hevel, think of the Eretz crying out, right, from the blood. Um, think, of, think of Gan Eden, right? And there is a kind of invisible vector between ourselves and the natural world where we are, and I'm sad to say it, we are still, right, not aware of how our actions or inactions or abuses find their way onto the land and the land cries out, right? So in the stories in Breshit, that's actually quite um, graphic how that happens. Um, that's the that's the invisible axis that's happening all through Rishi. Okay, let's talk about Shemitah. I think it's all really clear now, isn't it? How this is all Shemitah. So here's what I want to say about Shemitah. I'm not going to even look at this. No, got to look at the source. Is that right, Shabi? Do you mind putting them back up? Thank you so much. Um, there, there's there are only two sources from Shemitah that I brought. There's, there's actually you know, quite a number of places in Chumash where Shemitah shows up in Dvarim. It's like a, has a whole, other, um, a whole other focus. But the, the first mention of Shemitah here in Shemot comes really very clearly within um, a section of mitzvot which are highlighting and really teaching us, back to Yal's point, right? Teaching us how to do the ethical right and how to take care of those in our midst and how to really honor and respect the other, especially the other that we don't want to look at or we don't generally um, think about, and those are the disadvantaged. Um, if you just scroll down a little bit, Shabi, um, to the end there, okay, so starting in Pasuk Tet, um, thank you. V'ger lo tilchatz, v'yatem yadatem et nefesh hager, ki gerim heitem be'eretz mitraim, v'shei shanim tizra et artsecha v'yasavta tuata, so what's happening here in Shmot, right, with Shemitah, the real beneficiaries of Shemitah in this vision are the poor people, right? The poor people who would not have had access to produce on their own, the land again, invisible being made visible here. But on Shemitah, on the seven year cycle, when you let go, when you let go of your, shall we say, fiction, that you are the owner of this land and Magialanu, right? It's all coming to me, whatever it is that I've worked for. When you let go, you make possible those who don't have that power for them to be able to eat. And I love it. It's so beautiful when you're thinking about Breshit, right? Whatever the poor people don't eat, the animals will eat. Right, which is a kind of realignment the way we, we saw, and I forgot to point out in Breshi Paragalif, right? We eat the same thing as animals at the beginning, Breshi Paragalif. We have the same diet. And here you see in Shmot with Shemitah in the seven year cycle, the realignment, right? The corrective and the coming back in one aspect, both here, the, the horizontal with other people, and the beginning of the um, realignment with the land. Things are much more clear in Vayikra, Shavi. Thank you so much. 
um, just we'll just look at the beginning. It's a very long source, and I really encourage you to look at it more more carefully later. In in Vayikra, and I tried to highlight. I'm sorry, just scroll a little bit more. You see the orange and the blue, and then there is the purple. So the orange is you see the the expressions like Vishav Tahaaretz Shabbat La Hashem. The blue is Shabbat Shabbaton Yiela Aretz. And the purple is Vahita Shabbat Haaretz Lachem Leochla. There we have very clearly, right, the three axes. The Shemitah is not just as it is in Shemot, really about making sure to take care of poor people. It's not, as some, I would say, environmental groups will, will say today, it's just about the land and making sure that the land gets its due rest. It's also about restoring your relationship with God. It's also about restoring your relationship with yourself. And each of those comes in, a, in intertwinement with the other. So the three happen together in Shemitah, the opportunity to really let go of some of, again, again the fictions we have revolving ownership, fictions we have revolving certainty and who we are and what our position is and come back into this opportunity of a Breshi type of realignment, a corrective as you will, to be able to at least for a moment live in a time where we have Shabbaton in the fullest definition of Shabbaton, where we can, and here I would say, yes, I'm getting a little sermonic, right? But where we have the opportunity to kind of release ourselves from the boxes that we normally put ourselves in and say, wait a second, where have I gone out of whack? Like which, which part, which part? Maybe I'm doing really well in the vertical, halavai, right? Like I'm doing really well over here, but I've been, I haven't been taking care of the ethical or any of the other permutations. Shemitah gives us a chance not to choose, but says like all three, right? All three work together. And that kind of alignment is, as I said in the beginning, the kind of stopgap, the kind of safety net to help the Jewish people and ourselves, whether we're living in the land of Israel or not, to recognize that who we are by definition are those who are defined by these relationships in tension and hopefully in greater alignment with each other. Good, I did it. I left time for questions or comments. Um, if you want to write it in the chat, let me see, let me read what some people wrote before. Oh, and yeah, Emily, when you said about the the year do were you were you saying that because of um thinking of it as yush, yud reish dalid i mean it works very nicely anyhow but I, I think you may have been thinking of it with that show rash so i see yael has her virtual hand up so <laughs> go for it go ahead yael. great thank you i think that it's very, it's an interesting idea that when you when you pull back from something, whether you know, you're pulling back from work of the land or on Shabbat, you're pulling back from your creative work of the week, that that retreat, you know, something else fills the space. So it allows you to, I guess, focus on the other axes, which is very nice. So you pull back, but the space gets filled with something else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think that we, I mean, we know that, right? We know that from our weekly experience and we know that reflection is so hard, reflection and now we're adding something on, realignment is so hard to do when you're in the trenches and when you're in the, the, the mode of productivity. But the reflection really comes when you, right, when you clear your head and in this sense, really stop doing the kind of regular activities that, that always preoccupy you. You can't see straight, you can't see well you know, what you're doing. I, I'm curious, by the way, I mean, I've been, I did a lot of reading the summer about how Shemitah is being taken up, um, you know, conceptually, particularly in the diaspora, and I would say particularly by liberal communities, you know, there is a way in which Shemitah could be seen as a, another gift that we give the world in addition to Shabbat. You know, Shabbat clearly has had its had its imprint and you know all the the technological retreats and and what have you that have that have caught on but the shemitah idea for for a business you know or or for for a school or shall i say for a family of having like a regular interval where you stop the regular activities and you really ask yourselves those hard questions 
um, perhaps for in a non-Jewish context about your core values are how, how far out of alignment have we gone, right? But, but certainly in this perspective, it's not just any values. It's the fundamental values of how we're honoring and respecting our relationships. All right, thank you all so much. Oh, Emily, go ahead. Oh, she needs to be unmuted. Emily, just accept the button I just sent you. Oh, there you go. You can speak. We can hear I got you. It. I got it. I got it. All right. And you made me turn on the video. Not my favorite <laughs> thing on Zoom in particular. But in any event, um, to answer your, your previous uh, question, um, I uh, yes, I was using the Shorash of Yud Vresh uh, but, uh, as But I think it makes a lot of sense in the not so that we think we're so mighty and that we have to get down, but that we need to, I'm, you, I'm understanding the get down metaphorically as we need to understand these creatures. Even the birds, sometimes they, they, they land on the ground and they, and they take a little bit of a, a, little bit of a rest. Uh, so, um, and, and attitudinally, of course, that we are not so high. So I think that the word, it, it works on, on bo it, uh, both the uh, uh, Shorashim and Lichvosh, um, I wanted, I have heard it uh, interpreted as to channel, like Lichvosh at Yetzirah. So you're channeling it, you're sublimating it. Uh, so it uh, doesn't necessarily have to mean conquer in the term, in the sense of imposing power. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Those are such great ideas. Um, Emily, you're making me think of, and I wish I had it to share on the screen, but a Mary Oliver poem that, that I sometimes teach in the context of Hallel, right? Yeah. Which, which what you just reminded me of, and I'll end with this thought, you know, they you do in that expansive way that you just described it is really suggesting that there is obviously so much for us to learn from the natural world, not just on their own, but about ourselves. Um, and this poem of Mary Oliver, she talks about leaving her house in the morning and listening to the birds singing and, and recognizing a common joy and sense of praise. Maybe this is me and not her, but a praise of God that comes from all the creatures in the world. And there's a unity, right? There's a sense of connectivity that comes when you're really attentive and when you really listen and, and like you said, kind of stoop, right? Whether it's through a microscope or just right. your big eyes, right? But right. really recognizing that we are a part of this world and, 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 and not only do we have so much responsibility not to mess it up, but, but we have so much to learn about ourselves by recognizing that we are part and parcel of this, of this wider tapestry. So hopefully Shmita gives us that opportunity, right? Again, whether we're here or there to think about, um, you know, these fundamental truths. Oh yes, yeah, Sima, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to mention that your the preceding um, class with Erin Aaron Leib Smoker, she spoke about this, the approach of the Sfat Emmet on what Shmita can do for you as a, for your personality, the effect of Shmita on your personality. And one of the one of the approaches that she mentioned was this pulling back from engaging with the land is a transformative. Um, way of revisiting your relationship with the land and with yourself, kind of looking also at different axes in a different Hasidic um, approach, but um, even to make a man, a man a little bit more angelic, more like an angel whose single focus, only an angel only has one job and one task, we are so multitasked all the time that Shmita gives us a chance to be more like an angel, almost more like selling Elohim. If you tie that into Nase, Adam, or Kitsalmenu, what does that really mean? Does it mean to be more angelic? So it's it's a nice um, combination of, of, of um, information that we got from her and from you, but we're trying to put these two approaches together and they work together. Well, thank you. That's so great. I was sad that I missed your class. Thank you. I think it's also, um, you know, what you just made me think, and I, I know we have to go, but 
um, the kind of dance between co complexity, you know, or multitasking and singularity, right? I think you're right. I think that there's something in Shemitah which is saying, yes, you have so much to do and we are such complex creatures and the world is so, has so many parts to it. But sometimes you need to actually just pull back and look at things clearly and stop all of the multitasking. And I don't just mean this in a, you know, domestic sphere, but in a sense of, of conceptual focus, sometimes things need to be, you know, um, condensed into their barest of elements. And that too is to be a human being and not to try to hold everything all at once. So I, I, I love that. Thank you so much, Sima. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for learning with me. Shana Thank Tova. you so much.